Okay, so let's get started. Thank you very much for coming. We've got a full house. We're very impressed. Um, one announcement to make is that, remember the um, presentations downstairs, so if anyone gets a chance to go, there's a break after this session, and it'll be really appreciated. And there's lots of interesting things going on there. So this panel discussion is, how should we be investing in nature? And you'll notice that the chair was not me. Um, so I'm the second choice, but I'm better than he was. <laughs> and today, the panelists, we have um, Niall O'Donoghue, who's Assistant Chair Secretary General of the Department of Culture, Heritage and the Geltacht. We have Margaret O'Gorman, who's President at the Wildlife Habitats Council. We have Patrick Bresnahan, who's Assistant Professor in Geography from Trinity. And we have Bill Callanan, who is, and he gave me a very long title for his name, but let's give it a go. He is Head of Professional Agricultural Stream in the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, and he's also Head of Environmental Policy. Did I get it right? Great. So I would like this session to be as interactive as possible. It's a panel discussion. We want to keep it lively. We want to keep a healthy debate around it as well. So please do interact as an audience, and there'll be lots of opportunity um, for interactions through Slido and also interactions um, as opening up these up to the, the audience. So the first thing I wanted to ask the audience, and we'll be asking the panelists, is how do you think we should be investing in nature? And we're going to capture all of these. So I'm aiming that we have something a whole set of ideas, actions, etc., that can be taken forward by MPWS. So anything that's captured here that you write down, it will be, be brought forward. So I'll start with our panelists. I'll start with Niall. Niall, how do you think we should be investing in nature? Uh, good, a good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a see buying some time because I didn't think I was going. <laughs> much, to the, much to the comfort of my colleagues up here. Um, the, the first point is, and I, I made this last night to a, 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 to a group in Limerick, uh, in Limerick City Hall, in the context of the uh, consultation on Heritage 2030, which is open at the moment, in which this process over these two days will be feeding into as well, because sometimes biodiversity or nature gets lost in that argument. And I, I was the only one who spoke about biodiversity, much to the chagrin of the urban dwellers of Limerick. And I made the point that this, the, 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 the facile answer here is usually pointing at government. Um, and it's part of the answer, but it is, it is an easy one. And part of what uh, these two days are about is us taking a good look at ourselves and saying, we all own part of this opportunity, or we all own part of this problem. And it's really, from my perspective, and indeed from the department's perspective, because government can't do all, uh, thank you, Department of Health, um, but it's really about a partnership approach, and it's really about a mix of straightforward, I think, injection to the National Parks and Wildlife Service, to the traditional route, to the Department of Agriculture, but also looking at innovative financial instruments that release the latent equity, and I use that word advisedly, but natural capital equity in natural capital. I think one of the challenge of, uh, challenges around natural capital is that it is capital, but the challenge is how do you, like all other forms of capital, invest in it to renew it, to extend it, uh, and to improve it? And how do you leverage it in some sense? And I don't mean how do you simply commoditize it, although that, that's an option too. But I think we have been quite slow in this country to look at options other than direct government subvention. Um, I'm in the, the business of government long enough to recall when I had responsibility for the renewable energy brief we, in the 90s, we dared raise our head and talk about carbon exchanges. So what about the concept of natural capital exchanges? Uh, we talked about uh, tax credit for investment in renewables, and actually, for, at one stage, there was a there was an investment vehicle on the on the tax in the tax code. I don't think it's there any longer to encourage. And this is early stage investment in the 90s, uh, before I think the uh, people were as acutely conscious as, as they are now of the counterbalance or the counterweight between renewable investment and ecology and the economy and so on and so forth. But there were things like tax incentives for early stage investment. But above all, there were tax incentives for research and research on the, on, on the most sustainable forms of that technology and so forth. So I suppose to sum up, because I'm conscious I'm sharing, the, sharing the, uh, the platform here, I think we need to challenge ourselves 
to look beyond saying government give, and that's not to deny that government has a responsibility, but to look at the creative use of financial instruments to leverage, uh, I suppose, the motive force that currently is behind biodiversity and nature, because now is our moment. Uh, so I think we do need to recalibrate and re-engineer the kind of financial instruments uh, that the private sector can offer and that the government can, can, can kind of drive uh, to see what we get out of that as well. Great, thanks, Niall. And in fact, um, we don't have a finance person on this panel, and it may we plan to have one on the panel, so thank you for bringing up um, innovative financial instruments. It's really important. I was an economist once. Oh, great. <laughs> I deny it though, regularly. Margaret, <laughs> let's move to you. What, how should, do you think we should be investing in nature? Okay, thank you very much. That's like a big question and we could talk forever. And as a non-financial person who can still not understand what a credit default swap was that crashed our economy in 2008, I get nervous when we talk about putting nature in the hands of financiers, but that's just me. Um, so we can talk about that later. I think we should be investing in nature in every single way that we can. That seems like a pat answer, whether it's government, whether it's corporations or whatever it is, I think the fact that nature is so underinvested in. In the US, um, the budget for wildlife preservation is less than 0.1% of the federal budget. Now, we know the US budget is all skewed because of defense and everything else, but that still, that's a very small amount of money, but it still does a lot, and I can get into that, like how the US supports nature-based programming, because it is very interesting, and there's stuff, stuff we can learn from that. But from the corporate point of view, I think there's a lot of interesting ways in which companies can encourage investment in nature that is not necessarily asking them to um, put it into their profit and loss statements. So we work with a company in Detroit, Detroit Edison Electric. It's one of the largest um, electric utilities in the Midwest. And what they have done is they've basically said to their vendor pool, if you are doing nature-based programming and, have, and can show us what you're doing, we will give you more points in our selection of you. So they're driving a mechanism for their vendors to be competitive in the biodiversity space. So it's not just competitiveness on price, it's saying to vendors, do some nature. And they've got some other aspects of corporate citizenship that they're also doing. Um, then in the, um, in the area of the corporate supply chain, which is a huge area that's growing it started off, of course, with human rights and labor practices, but now the corporate supply chain areas are moving and blossoming, pun intended, into biodiversity areas where the, the entire auto industry has a supply chain initiative where they are and expecting their suppliers who want to be part of the green supply chain to engage in nature. So it's a really simple way of a company using its leverage. So when you have a General Motors, you have a Toyota, you have a Fiat Chrysler, or these are the three companies that are doing this. When you've got these companies leading the way, the others will follow. And I think they're very interesting ways to invest in nature. Now on the other side with the government interventions, um, you know, there's a lot of areas I think that we can learn from other countries and certainly, you know, in the U.S. the Farm Bill has amazing conservation programming where the farmers are actually paid rental payments if they sign their lands into conservation agreements for eight to ten years. It's not one year because nothing's going to happen when they sign it into one year, but it has to be an eight to ten year commitment. And in the Northeast they've actually recovered the bog turtle through government investment in setting aside marginal lands to restore wetlands where the farmers are being paid by the federal government a rental payment to set those lands aside. And there are other really cool things that they're doing in those areas and they're very much tied to action on the ground. They're tied to proving that the action happens, not just some nebulous set aside that you're, you don't, you're not required to do anything with, but it's a specific species, a specific habitat that they're doing. And they're kind of cool, um, they're moving the needle in many ways in the, in the farming aspect in those uh, threatened and endangered species range areas. And there are other land aspect, land management aspects such as conservation easements and things like that which can also be explored which provide tax breaks for setting land aside but we can get into that later. So I know you chaired the last session was it engaging businesses with biodiversity. And is that something that we need to do better in Ireland, that we engage businesses for investment, for investing in biodiversity? I think it's something we need to do across the world. <laughs> and I think there's so much potential there. 
because um, there's a willingness for companies. They, there's a huge knowledge gap in companies that we don't know what to do. And when they get these really good um, partnerships with the NGO community and get comfortable with thinking about their lands in different ways, there actually is an enormous amount that can be done within the corporate sector. So I say Ireland, England, whatever, if England has any businesses after Brexit. Sorry, I had to get a Brexit joke because everybody was making them this week. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, you know, all across the world, I think there's a really great um, potential for business to start really pivoting to think about biodiversity, okay. but for NGOs to pivot and think about, and think about the corporate world as potential for biodiversity. Thank you. Patrick, sure. moving to you, from your perspective, how do you think we should be investing in nature? Well, I would, first of all, I would probably start by saying there's a bit of a, a problem with the question, which mm -hmm. you might think is typical I academic. I love it, it's an academic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's actually, it, it's, it's a more significant point is that the investing in nature, it can send us off in this direction, which both the previous speakers were talking about, about how we raise new sources of, of financial investment, which of course is important. But I think that if we broke the question down a bit and thought about how we're already investing in activities, um, and some activities destroy or work against vibrant environments and, and rich biodiversity, all the things that most of the people here, all people here uh, are, are supportive of. And then other activities promote rich, healthy environments and ecosystems. So the question is, more about how do we stop investing in those activities that are destroying biodiversity, and vice versa, how do we invest in those activities that promote nature? So if you, <laughs> if you start with the, pro the, the, the report that Craig Bullock and Rachel Morrison um, uh, wrote recently or published, they were speaking yesterday, I think, they talk about how um, Finance in Ireland has been used to counter the external environmental and social costs of public and private sector activities in various economic sectors related to land use, planning, and energy. Significant sums are spent by agencies such as the EPA to monitor and minimize environmental impacts. So I think it was 75% of national uh, uh, funding for biodiversity is um, connected to agriculture. So there's already a lot of money being spent but it's in a contradictory way because on one hand you have policies which are supporting a certain intensification, a certain you know, model of agriculture which I'd be quick to say I'm not blaming the current government or uh, farmers at, at the moment. We're talking about an agricultural sector that has developed over 50, 60 years. It's had investments over 50, 60 years from uh, the state, from the European Union, building markets, all sorts of infrastructure. Those are all in place. And that makes it a very complex question about how you try to dismantle that or, or challenge it. But I think we have to have those questions. And then in order to think about other ways of, you know, other alternative systems of food production, of land use, we have to be investing in things that people have spoken about here, such as the agri-environment programs, but also alternative food systems, which hasn't been mentioned so much. So, you know, organic or investing in infrastructure for local markets or... Uh, training or all sorts of things that, you know, people who are developing community-supported agriculture, um, who supply local markets, Talav Bio that has just started, which is a network of, of people who work on the land, they're all asking these questions and looking for investment, and I think that would be a good place to, to go. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. And a, a good um, point to move on to. Yeah. Bill, I didn't put it them in this order, by the way. Um, okay. So, Bill, from your perspective, working in the Department of Agriculture, how do you think we should be investing in nature? And I suppose it'd be great to pick up on some of Patrick's points there as well. I'll give a few musings because I certainly don't have the answer in terms of the question. But I suppose I, the older I get, the more I realize I don't have the answers. So bear with me in terms of that. But I look at things very simply in terms of a role, I suppose, as a regulator and equally as an enabler of industry. And that's really, there are three critical drivers for me in terms of change, and they are regulatory. So in other words, you're increasing the minimum uh, regulatory requirement. Incentivization, which is similarly in the agriculture field, would be the likes of agri-environment and a support for a policy direction in relation to that. And I suppose we have those and well understood in terms of how they impact. And the one area I think that we're not capitalizing enough on is the question of market pull. So, so the, I suppose the uh, direction that's being reflected back to farmers in terms of 
you know, the market pull or the demand that's here in relation to it. And that's a challenging space in many ways, and I suppose uh, there are two ways to look at that. One is it's quite clear that the market is demanding greater sustainability. I mentioned it yesterday, you know, once you have, I suppose the primacy is the availability of food, and I suppose we are a first world country, you cannot uh, deny there's a significant uh, um, absence of availability for everybody. Safety then becomes the next standard, and then sustainability becomes critical beyond that. And it depends on what market you're supplying as to which of those becomes the, I suppose, the driving force in relation to uh, decisions on purchasing. But from a market pull point of view, we're hearing this, let's say, through the likes of Origin Green programs, etc., a clear requirement for additionality in terms of sustainability, uh, a confidence in the claims that you're making in relation to that. And I think that's going to be a very confusing space for the population at large. And if I take by way of example, uh, you take dairying and there's been an expansion in Ireland and it's often criticised, but 50% of all dairy cows across Europe will be housed permanently come 2020. And if you look at the likes of a Dutch production system, they're incentivising uh, where a farmer is letting cows out for six hours a day for 120 days. It's about 0.3 of a cent per litre additional payment. In Ireland, we'd consider that poor. It's poor standard, if you know what I mean. Uh, but it has gained a certain amount of traction. And I suppose that will be a very, very, I suppose, uh, challenging discussion as to you know, what the consumer wants and how that translates back to industry, back to the farmer in terms of what actions they should be taking. And I think industry understands that, but I'm not so sure that farming does. And farmers themselves, you need to translate it into language that they can understand in terms of actually you know, what has been asked by the market. And it's not enough just simply to say that uh, well, it's a market entry point that the standards need to go up just to get access to the market. Farmers themselves will have to gain some benefit from this additionality that will be required in the future, and that's not always evident. Uh, so uh, my core point in terms of investing is, I suppose, we have three levers, is regulation, um, incentivization, and market messaging back to the industry. And I don't think that market messaging is sufficiently uh, pulling a certain, it is pulling, but we need to articulate that better. There's also the second part, which is corporate finance and how to, I suppose, secure some of that. And increasingly large corporations, as I said earlier, are becoming conscious of their civic engagement, their corporate responsibility, etc. And we are getting, uh, it's a very early stage commencement in terms of willingness to engage and to support, such as in areas of biodiversity. And by way of example, in the Department of Agriculture, just quite recently, our forestry division have uh, promoted a woodland environment fund. So effectively, the state is supporting the planting of broadleaf trees and the significant grant aid and incentive for that, but is now creating, in many ways, a, a tinder for the environment between corporate entities and farmers, which will encourage corporate entities to put up a thousand euros per hectare. And if you look at their costs of for example, promotion, you know, a half page in a newspaper is 25,000 plus and they can get 25 hectares of naming rights almost in relation to uh, broadleaf uh, plantation and the support of that. They start looking at this as maybe being attractive. It's at a very early stage. It's been put up quite recently on the uh, department's website and we're really only enabling. So we're committing to the support for the pl farmer planting. That is not changing, but inviting corporate uh, responsibility to subvent and additional uh, funding into that process to encourage it and a number of key corporations in Ireland have identified an interest in that so there's two additional pieces then for me is the market messaging from the market but also corporate responsibility and access to funding. Thanks Bill. I didn't introduce myself either. I'm Eugenie Regan. I work at UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Centre and I'm particularly interested in this area. I was at a conference in New York in the beginning of January organised by Credit Suisse and it was a conservation investment conference and it was full of finance people, interestingly, um, and very few NG NGOs there. And last year the same conference had 150 people and this time the room held 315 and they'd turned people away. So there's a huge interest in investing in conservation impact from impact investors, from pension fund holders, etc. And I think there's a massive potential there. The key challenge is, and it was mentioned in an earlier session, that there's more money than projects we have. 
and we haven't really established a, a way of, of harnessing this money and, and pulling it in. But I'd like to open it up to the questions that are coming through on the Slido. Can we put them up? There's one from Rory Sheehan, so you can vote on them when they come to the top, if everyone's aware of that. And it says, will every area or county have an NPWS ranger by 2020? That's it. <laughs> if I have anything to do with it, yes. Um, we are finally recruiting again, um, Rory, so absolutely. Um, the, I, I think the, the target is 84. Uh, and I think we, we're currently, I think, at about 67 or 68. Uh, so we hope to hit that target. So the answer is yes. We don't assign rangers on a county by county basis. They're assigned on a region by region basis. And uh, I mean, uh, they are probably the most incredibly valuable members of our staff, but all too different to people in the room because they cover such a range of work from, from compliance to, to national park management, uh, etc. So yes. Great. That's very encouraging. Thank you. The next question, can we keep banking uh, on global perception of our rich natural heritage for ecotourism and origin green marketing for food exportation when it's not a reality? I don't know if anyone wants to pick up on that. Yeah, well, Go on, Bill. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to agree, we cannot keep banking. No, that's an absolute given, you know. Um, the reality nowadays with any brand management is, you know, they're, they're extremely vulnerable to, uh, to uh, challenge. Uh, so you need the evidence to support it, and I think you need to have progress. And whilst you can criticise uh, something like Orange and Green, the reality is it's an evolutionary process, and it is a movement, and, and it is a direction. Um, so, so from my perspective, you know, I, I come from a scientific background, so credibility in terms of, you know, what you're stating underpins everything. Mm -hmm. So you can't keep ban banking unless you invest in that evolution but I, I think people have to be realistic as well in terms of uh, you know the reality is that in the global food environment sustainability is critical but competitiveness underpins everything if you're not competitive in terms of that supply equally so you just don't get to market like and as you go shopping and you look for the uh, special offers in the discount aisle just reflect on that and I suppose this is what I meant about the messaging back uh, you know that farmers themselves you know need to see some almost financial encouragement and, and a buy-in to the direction that they're being uh, asked to go in relation to this. Thank you. Would either of you, Patrick or Margaret, like to pick up on that as well? I'd maybe say something that's a bit tangential. It's related to that agriculture, which is that <clears throat> often we talk about agriculture or we talk about farming or we talk about the ag sector or these terms. And, you know, the more I, I've done research around it and you know, spoken to farmers and, you know, gone around rural Ireland, it's less and less clear to me what it means. And I feel like there needs to possibly be more attention when we talk about, use these terms. Firstly, to think about the historical development of the sector. To think about how, for example, agriculture was very different 50 years ago to how it is now. To think about how farming was very different to how it was now. We have to think about things like, um, when we talk about the agricultural sector, are we talking about Glambia? And are we talking about marketing? Are we talking about processing, where a lot of the value is captured you know, further down the stream? Or are we talking about the primary producers, the people who are actually working on the land producing milk? They're very different things. Mm -hmm. um, and confusing these things doesn't help us. And I think distinguishing between them might actually help us see that certain models or trajectories of agricultural development are not just bad for the environment, but also bad for rural communities and the farmers who live there. So it's not a kind of contradiction. Thanks, Patrick. The next question, what do the panel think of in the Environment Committee of the European Parliament um, Valentine, Valentine's Day proposal of ring fencing 20 billion per year from CAP for biodiversity? Is that what it says? Ring fencing, or 200, yeah. yeah. Any thoughts on that? So that was announced recently. The very clear reality is, if you look at the direction of CAP, <coughs> CAP policy has changed enormously over a number of generations. I uh, fully agree with this man in terms of the picture 50 years ago versus today. You know, and these are big policy changes, and 
farmers have adapted to them and embraced it and, and I work in a place where it's often challenging in terms of that evolution. You know, but if you look at the likes of Mac Shari, the Fischler, you know, you had introduction of extensification payments when suddenly there was a surplus production. You had decoupling of payments from production. You've had the evolution of introduction of the likes of greening payments and people can criticize it, but you know, the reality is there's a further evolution now occurring in relation to the expectation of CAP and the environment. And it has identified uh, you know, a requirement for 30% minimum <coughs> uh, in terms of the proposal at biodiversity and 40% of the overall in terms of climate change. You know, so like as a policy instrument, these are quite substantial in terms of the change over, you can say at a pace that people uh, would like to be faster here, but from a public policy point of view is quite, quite rapid. Uh, I always caution people in relation to the challenge before us in agriculture is that you know, we have to deliver more in terms of this space, but equally so, we have a huge issue in terms of delivering climate. I head up climate, water, and biodiversity. They are all intertwined. Ideal sweet spot is measures that effectively support all those ambitions, but it is not always the case. And your cohort of focus can be different in relation to those. You know, because if you look at it from a biodiversity and climate point of view, there's huge stores in certain areas, but with an objective at national level, of a commitment to reduce by 30%, I need to look for additionality. Mm -hmm. So what's additional to just it being there and current, which is unfortunate. So uh, it's going to be a big balancing act into the future in relation to it, but it's quite obvious the direction of travel in terms of CAP is for, for uh, more ambition in relation to the environment. Mm -hmm. There's also another question for you, Phil. Um, is the department planning to fund research on alternative food systems? We put about 15 to 20 million, uh, it was came up at a, uh, a conference event yesterday in relation to research and we should be supporting more. We put about 15 to 20 million into research annually out of the department. Uh, I can't get ahead of the system in terms of, but, but we'd, we'd be quietly ambitious for an early uh, uh, um, opening in relation to a, a future call this year. Uh, you take that as you will. Uh, but. Uh, we fund primary research and environment is a key pillar of that and actually uh, is probably one of the strongest pillars in terms of what we support and we're very clear in terms of the space we do in relation to research. It's very much at investigator level, it's that early, you know, uh, it's the unattractive for business type research so it's, it's uh, very front edge early uh, I I research objectives, etc. So we're not close to the market or that, that's a space for others. Uh, it's done through, fundamentally, through the uh, research institutions such as Trinity, uh, the other universities, uh, Chagask, etc. But it's a quite a significant investment and certainly research and biodiversity, etc. would be a, a big pillar in that and the environment. We're changing the structure to better, I suppose, align how uh, I suppose the different projects because we had a, a tree prong which was forestry, uh, stimulus and food firm, right? And we are changing that to better align with kind of uh, themes, I suppose is the best way I'd describe it, but it is around project-based research. So a lot of people here I know are from the research community, so I, I think I need to mention that. Great, thank you. The next poll, if we could get that one up, is um, focusing on, on what we all think are the priorities, so it'd be great if you could contribute to that. And this panel discussion was around, you know, how should we be investing in nature, but some of the sub-questions that were put to us was, how should we be spending the money, what are the priorities, and how should we ensure maximum positive impact? So I'll go to the panel first. What, what do you think are the priorities? And I'm going to go the, the other direction and put Bill back on the spot again. So. <laughs> I, I, well, actually, good, uh, I've said too much, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go on, I'll come back well, to you then. Yeah. Patrick. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the priorities. I think um, what I would say, there's lots of things you could say in a short amount of time. Um, I'd say it's partly inspired by the session that came before this with the Burn program and the, the Pearl uh, River Mussel project and the Aran Island uh, agri-environmental scheme. And what, what kind of came across to me about those three presentations was there was a, a sort of a subtle difference between the Burn program and the other two, which was that um, it was Sharon Parr who was presenting. Um, the things that she emphasized that had really sort of supported that project were things like time, 
uh, which allowed the building up of relationships, of listening to the, the farmers in the, in the burn, um, you know, uh, understanding their, their experiences, their concerns, um, and how that kind of infrastructure, if you want to call that, then sort of gave rise to this question of maybe we can use results-based uh, uh, approaches to help farmers, you know, at least compare what they're doing in their different, with, with the land and so on. So it didn't begin with an emphasis on metrics and results-based performance and payments. It began by investing in people and in a place and in the kinds of infrastructures that are really a long-term investment. And I think that that's what I would say because that's a 20-year program now. At the beginning, or even after four or five years, maybe it wouldn't have been able to show uh, you know, all of the things that have now come to fruition and all of us here celebrate it. But it needed that long-term investment and it needed an investment in those people. So I would say that. Yeah. Mm, fantastic. Margaret? Sure. Um, I think that the priority should be always land. And that sounds very simple. But when we think about industry, there's a statistic out there. There are more parking lots than there are mines in the world. Yet we go after the miners. But is anybody going after the parking lots? The way we use our land and the way we plan for the way our land is used is the ultimate decider of the health of biodiversity in the future because we can't have one without the other. So really understanding the benefits of regional planning and the benefits of smart urban planning, if we need to densify as communities and live in denser communities, how do we do that and include nature? And if we want to have healthy areas outside of cities, to, so to me, it's a very simple question. The priority for the future is land and land everywhere. Thanks, Margaret. Um, I agree with everything that's been said, but uh, and not to not to be pat about it. Absolutely, uh, for me, community is key. Um, uh, I grew up on a raised bog and harvested that um, and in a rural community. Um, and most of that land is now designated for the hen harrier, uh, which takes, a sig takes away a significant amount of its traditional economic value. Wonderful from a natural capital point of view. Not a whole lot of use if you're a small farmer trying to raise three kids. But the, the, so we have, to be, we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to be cognizant of communities and we have to be cognizant of people who live in those communities if we want people to remain in those communities. And that is a complex challenge in rural Ireland. We heard John Fitz talk about that yesterday morning in a, in a, in a way far more eloquent than I. The priorities for me, 14% of this country is designated with 440 special areas of conservation. And being frank about it, we are way behind in terms of what we need to do there. So the priority for me is investment in conservation management, management plans with communities and with people in those 430 sites. We absolutely have to do, have to do that. Um, a second priority for me is investment in uh, the 87,000 hectares that we own in national parks. And this is about the wellness piece. And again, this is not simple. It is the, 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 the everyday balance we need to achieve between amenity and conservation. Uh, and that amenity has to include wellness. Uh, and we have, again, coming back to your car park argument, um, we are, we're a country in which public transport doesn't really serve the regions. So, uh, uh, you know, taking the engine out of the car is not a solution. Mm -hmm. So we got to work with that, absolutely. Um, and w we need to invest in that. And thirdly, the other priority for me, and I think the, the President said it very well, it's investing in the intellectual specialisms uh, and expertise to get that balance right and not in a way that excludes rural communities and that excludes people. Um, because we can have all the habitat in the world, but without people, I think we, you know, it cannot, they, there cannot be that dichotomy, and that is absolutely crucial. And if I am a critique of policy in the past, I think when we, um, when we look back at maybe where we've gone wrong and where we have drawn the huge rows about in, in environmentalism, it is where we have forgotten to engage with and bring along those communities. So they're my priorities, sir. Thanks. That was emphasizing my point. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Just, I suppose, look at the priorities for me. I'd, I'd agree with Niall in terms of that discussion with communities. Uh, because I deal with water, 
climate and uh, biodiversity collectively. Let's be honest about it, between transport and agriculture, we're 77% of the non-ETS with clear targets into the future. I think how that integrates with biodiversity is going to be important in terms of those twin aims uh, along with water. Uh, but I do think that if you look at from a political point of view, you know, there's been a real rise in populism and that whole challenge, which I think the, the, the president spoke to this morning. So we need to communicate, and it's just not about expertise, but translating it into a language that people can understand. Right across the world, whether it's yellow vests, whether it's opposition to water charges in Ireland, you know, I, I describe it to people who tell you what to do is, did you ever have a neighbor whose first reaction is, now what you should do now is, and your first reaction is, what you should do now is, you can, you know, and I won't finish it off. <laughs> the, la the language is, what we should do, and we need to communicate in a way that people can understand. And that's just not at you know, an intellectual level, it's at a society level, that you can get into a room uh, you know, at a rural location and talk to people and connect that they can understand what the hell we're doing. It was quite shocking, I think, the uh, statement somebody made in relation to the McGillicuddy Riggs project on the IP that people didn't understand why the land was designated. They don't understand, they're never going to deliver yeah. it. And that's the simple reality of it. Uh, so priorities for the future. I'm going to digress because I should have said something on the research uh, answer as well. As well. Uh, I, I saw Michal Breen at the back of the audience and he just twigged to me as well that uh, th there's a significant volume of money available under life budgeting at EU level. Bill, your book is covering the mic. Oh, sorry, there's yeah, a significant amount of money under EU life funding at 3.5 billion or 4 billion at the moment in the current period. And that will double in the next period. And to be honest, which Ireland has not been good in relation to a proportionate drawdown of that, it's another avenue, I think, from a research point of view, and I just would like people to reflect on that. Back to the Brilliant. question. Can, okay. I add, can I add something? Yeah, go on just because I think it's important to say, because a lot of the emphasis is on rural Ireland, and obviously that's important, but um, in the context of communities and investing in, in, in communities and how important people are for, for caring for biodiversity and nature, it's also the case in cities. Sure. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just thinking of an example of a friend of mine whose mother, it's in London, but similar dynamics to here, where she had lived in an apartment block since the 70s. People owned those apartments and had lived there over 30 years, and they had a community garden on the roof. And it was, it was because they all lived there that they shared this community garden. When they, so people sold up because the prices went up, they were then rented out, and it was much, short -term, much more short-term lets. The community garden fell apart. That's a, one example, but I think you could say, you know, there's a lot of talk about trying to green the city and bring in, you know, community gardens or green spaces. And I do think that there's room there for communities, but thinking laterally, that relates to housing. So there, there are all these connections, you know, that we, we can't just sort of silo biodiversity into. Mm. That's right. Where, yeah. Something that the panel has all brought up about relationships and communities and that long-term aspect to it as well. Um, what's coming out from the audience? Um, biodiversity is obviously at the forefront. What are the priorities for the future? Um, soil, there's a lot of people putting soil in there. Nature, collaboration. And you can see collaboration and people, um, mm -hmm. solutions, education, is all place preserving, all things that you've touched on as well. So there's a whole pile more questions. I don't know if anyone would like to, there's a question down here as well. Uh, yes, Chair. Uh, M Michael Spellman is my name. I'm president of ICOS, which is the organisation that um, looks after the cooperatives and particularly all the major dairy processing co-ops. And I have to say, first of all, that the organisation is completely supportive of all the measures that are required to address the important issues of today, be it climate change, carbon reduction, biodiversity, water quality or whatever. But when you ask the question there, what are the priorities that have to be addressed now? Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about this for some time, Chair. That when we joined the EU back in the early 70s, that was set up and continued to be a great supporter of the, the if you like, supporting a cheap food policy for the citizens of Europe. The reality is, and this is an absolute reality, that most of the primary producers of food in Ireland and indeed across Europe today are getting no more for the product than they did 30 years ago. And the question that I would be asking now is, if it's a thing we have to get, and there's no doubt, we have to get serious about 
addressing the challenges of nature and biodiversity. And if we take it seriously and say, we will do what is required, my question is, are the consumers of today prepared to pay more for what they are consuming? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Does anyone like to pick up on that question? I think it's a great question and I'd love to know the answer. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk um, about organic farming and how great that is, but certainly in the US where I live, there's a limit. People will not pay a premium, not everybody. People will go to Whole Foods, which is also known as Whole Paycheck because it's so expensive, which is where the organic meat is. But the average consumer, especially in the US, is so used to cheap food. I mean, it's, it's absolutely crazy. So how much is the average consumer, not the progressive consumer or the affluent consumer, but the average consumer willing to pay for that, that premium? I think it's a great question, and I think we don't ask it enough in terms of what are we willing to do in, in, for both biodiversity and climate change. Are we willing to pay twice as much for cars? Are we willing to be mandated to only have one car for family? Are we willing, like, go on a ration book for meat because it's all organic? You can only have meat once a week under that. So what are we willing to do as a consumer? I think it's a great question. I don't have the answers. <laughs> I, I think that I, I fully agree, Michael. I suppose just a couple of comments in terms of, I suppose, the supply chains for food, if you look at it. Um, the reality is we are becoming a more urbanized society. We have passed the point when 50% of all the world's population are urban now. That will increase. It's expected to, to continue that way. We also are at a point when we're looking at 9 billion people and more. You know, and I suppose the reality of food security, we take it for granted. This may appear flippant, but I was very uh, involved in Star Memma and the response from an agriculture point at the time, and I remember talking to somebody involved in the, uh, the food side and um, a local manager of a, uh, I don't know, it was an Aldi or one of those, which was saying actually the three things that ran out the door the day before the storm were uh, bread, wine, and ice cream. And I was like, <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> you know, there's something wrong in this system, you know, in terms of... Nothing free range eggs. Yeah. Uh, nothing, yeah. But, you know, we just take it for granted. You know, and if you look at even the reality is that people get criticized, uh, farmers, you know, 30% uh, of food, there is more food wasted in Europe than there is produced in the Horn of Africa. And like we all have a collective responsibility to it. And farming is getting massive negative press at the moment, which annoys the hell out of me, because the reality is, and I explain it simply, farmers will produce the food that people consume, not that people consume the food that farmers produce. So if the market demand is for different products, etc., and the simple reality of the direction of society is that it is more complicated food chain supply, which is, you know, it's organic has a, a strong role to play in, in certainly in developed countries, you know, but the vast majority of food is going to remain along uh, simplified systems. And if you look at buyers, etc., they're asking for more continually as a point differentiation for sale. The question, as Michael has said, is, Where's the benefit to farmers in terms of that to encourage it as well, which is critical, has to be part of that dialogue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Patrick? Say something. I just uh, in response to that, I wouldn't agree with the idea that it's, it's market pull. I mean, if you think about how Ireland's agricultural sector has developed, there was too much milk produced because of policies that were about you know, developing this particular sector and, and pasture. What happened then? New markets had to be found for the milk which meant uh, opening up global uh, uh, trade agreements, but then also new products had to be developed, which is why milk in Ireland is being turned into baby powder or baby formula and then being sold in China. That is not a pull. That is about opening up new markets through quite deliberate policies. So I, th I think that's important because you could make the same argument then that we need to open up different markets through policies, <coughs> through investments. Um, okay, leaving that aside, I think that the question that was raised about you know, this idea that the people who produce the milk are not getting paid. So that's cheap work. We're all here because of nature being cheapened and because of cheap food. Those three things are all generated by the same food system. Mm -hmm. And I think if we talk about it in those terms, we can get away from this kind of very unhelpful uh, debate, which I, I completely agree with um, here. 
of farmers versus the environment or farmers versus uh, conservationists to recognize that we maybe have the same common uh, enemy and that what we need to do is think about what a lot of people have talked about here very well and creatively about alternative ways of using the land, of growing food and so on. Um, so I think once we can move the story or the, 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 the debate on, and I know that the media often doesn't help, I think that we'll be making progress. Um, and, and also one last thing in the context of storms and climate change, but also things like Brexit, whether we like it or not, there are a lot of pressures, not just questions of loss of biodiversity, that maybe will force our food system to change. Um, supply chains are very vulnerable. You know, markets are very vulnerable. So the sooner we try to do it in a kind of a reasonable way, rather than waiting for some kind of breakdown, like a more storms, the better. I wonder also whether you know the, the, the buyers of our products from farmers are intermediaries, so actually corporates as opposed to the end consumer. And maybe we should bring you asking them as well. And they are looking at supply chains, and they are looking at how climate change and biodiversity loss is going to impact on them. Mm -hmm. And they are looking at how they can spend pay more to know that they've got a secure supply chain. So I think that's an interesting one that we could pick up on as well. Um, any other questions? And I'm going to just, if, if we can get the mic to the next question, I want to just pick up on one very quickly that's come up here and has had a lot of votes for it, which is for Niall. So will the department fund a biodiversity officer in each local authority? <laughs> I think that, that, that's carried by approbation. Um, what we've committed to is doubling the funding for uh, biodiversity actions by local authorities. We're not the employer of the biodiversity officer, so it's up to the local authority. If the way it wants to go forward is to hire a biodiversity officer, great. Because uh, we, we certainly see the value of, of architecture conservation officers in local authorities and heritage officers in local authorities. But we're not saying to the local authorities in this, it has to be this particular route. If that's the route they want to go, fantastic. Thanks, Niall. So the next question here. Hi, this is Mike Brennan from the Eastern Midland Regional Assembly. Just, um, First to Bill and, and then Margaret, maybe you can come in on this. What do you think is the role for um, requiring public, uh, public bodies to source their food in, from local suppliers? Is, is like green procurement, like mandatory local, localization of your, your, your food stocks, is that something that can have an impact and maybe address local supply chains, security of supply chains, rural um, sustainability, those sort of issues? What do you, what, what do, do, should the public sector lead on this? Uh, I don't know, is the answer, unfortunately. I suppose it, it's, it's not something is in my gift or remit in relation to it. But to be honest with you, in terms of the agricultural, uh, I suppose, element of this conversation, you know, we export 90% of our meat and our milk, which are the two main things. So I'm more concerned with how do we invest biodiversity and, and sustainability and achieve those objectives for that as a product? And you know, local is, is, is great, but it's not going to uh, effectively deal with what is the majority of production in Ireland in relation to it. I suppose internationally, the reality is, I suppose, we can criticize ourselves here, and we should and, uh, as a driver of progress. But internationally, in terms of food systems, you know, a pastoral-based rain-fed system for livestock production is seen as, as positive, and we shouldn't dismiss that. So from a water point of view, if you look at the investment requirement for water into dairying, it's about six litres of water to a, a litre of milk. Uh, in the likes of dairy production in the United Arab Emirates, it's 1,200 litres. About 70 to 80 percent of all water abstraction in the world goes for irrigation, not for human consumption. It's not exactly a problem we have here in Ireland. It's a great country if we could put a roof over it. <laughs> you know, but the simple, like, we, you know, we're in the top third in terms of water quality, accepting we're not on the right trajectory in terms of achievement of good status. Uh, you know, our carbon footprint, relatively speaking, is good, accepting equally so that the, the dialogue alone about improvement to that is fine, but it, we have a national objective in terms of reducing emissions that we have to commit and deliver upon. And the same with biodiversity, you know, if you look, um, we are not doing well in relation to habitats in the country, but there's a huge diversity of farming landscape, if you want to call it that, within what is a very small area, whereas if you drive on the continent or drive in America, you can 
you know, you could drive for a day and not see a change, you know. Uh, so, like, about 4% of our land area is, is um, uh, hedges, and about between another 4 or 5% is scrub, single trees, etc. you know, so it's about 8 or 9% in total. Uh, so I think we have to be, we have to, I suppose, credit what we have, but recognizing there's a big job of work to, to, I suppose, to develop that, to invest better and wiser into the future, and to be able to, I suppose, articulate that story from a farming point of view uh, positively, uh, but with a, a need for continued progress. That's the way I describe it. Mm -hmm. Can I get, there's a question at the back there, please. Right the back. Right by the door, yeah. Thank you. Um, I've seen this across a number of sessions and a few people raised the question about jobs. There was one in relation to local authorities, the biodiversity officers, National Parks and Wildlife Service. And there's another thing I saw in these sessions that I've taken a bit of issue with, where I've heard people talking about there being plenty of money available for projects. And I would work for an organization that has applied for life funding three times, but have never got it. I'm not poor me here now, right? But the EIP process that people speak a lot about, that was hugely oversubscribed, and there was loads of projects didn't get anywhere. And in terms of a project, the project has two things in its life cycle. One is it, the development of it, and then there's the sustaining of that project going forward. And the most critical thing that's needed for all of that, in terms of where we put our money, is towards jobs for people to do that work. And we were involved in a recruitment process last year um, for the place where I work, and there was people from all over the country that were maybe between 20 and 40 years old that are highly qualified, loads of volunteer experience. They've got everything that this country needs in terms of our helping biodiversity, but none of them have jobs. And it's like the, the most seriously under-resourced part of the whole thing. And if we want to make all this stuff happen, the money will be wasted unless we have the right people to do the jobs. So my question is, how can we grow the biodiversity workforce in Ireland? Thank you. I won't comment, but to agree in part in relation to it, yes, it is a competitive process in terms of these, but that's necessary as well to ensure the standard of what you're getting, so, so there's a balance. But I would agree in part in relation to some of the expertise. So soil is the one that just jumped out. Mm -hmm. We have very little soil expertise left in the country, and uh, it is something that we, we need to be mindful. I'm head of a professional service, so I'm just conscious of we have... Uh, <coughs> Like even within the department, we've taken on a number of ecologists to supplement the expertise we have in terms of agriculture as well. We have three ecologists taken on it last year. Um, this is for the department, like. Right? Uh, in terms of the department itself is. Before the, before the downturn, the department was about 4,500, and it's now 3,100, give or take, okay? Now, that's divided amongst administrative staff, veterinary staff, inspectors, technical, okay? I head up the inspectors, we're about 220 or 30, and that includes people working with dairy qualifications, general agriculturalists, chemistry, ecotoxicologists. Uh, we are the main employer in terms of ecotoxicologists in the country, as far as I can understand. Uh, we have a number of environmentalists, engineering, so it's a, it's a broad skill base. Uh, but that's not, we also then have Chagask as an agency of the department. I don't have its employment number, but th there's a significant investment in research there as well. And then Borbia, and there's quite a number of the Marine Institute, for example. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a broad church. Any, any other panelists want to react to the jobs question? Other than I think it's a great uh, idea, it's really important. Um, it relates to the thing about investing in people. So it's not just communities that are already there or people who are farmers or work on the land, but all the kinds of ancillary kind of support jobs, scientists and so on. And something that I've come across in my own work dealing with employees of some state agencies who are working in the environmental field is also not just, not just the jobs, but the um, security of the jobs which relates to what I was saying about uh, consistency over time, and that in order to build up these kinds of infrastructures in places and knowledge, you need continuity. Mm 
And so if people are being hired on four-year projects or five-year projects or on these cycles, which are very much tied to funding, that's not good for the, 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 the quality of the knowledge. It's not good for the relationships they build. It's, um, it's too temporary. But if, it's to bring, if we were to bring it back to the theme of the panel, I mean, it is about money and it's about decisions over how money is spent. And this is about public money. I, 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 you know, it's not about you know, finding um, you know, ways of attracting private finance or anything like this. It's about decisions over things like taxation and redistribution and you know, old-fashioned questions like that, mm -hmm. uh, which I think are obviously very important. So there's a question here at the top of the Slido. Um, do you think the public will be willing to pay more tax to support biodiversity, given people benefit so much from biodiversity? Patrick, to you first. Um, well, again, I would change the question a bit. Because <laughs> if you were to couch it in the terms that we're talking about it, if you were to think about investment in biodiversity and conservation as part of rural development, in a context where everything's being stripped out in a way of rural, like post offices we hear, the drink driving and you know people not being able to get places, roads, uh, water treatment, which is an area I work in. There's a lot of infrastructures that are being withdrawn or pulled back so people can't live in these places. So if you were to see biodiversity as something attached to rural development, where people were working on these projects that were based in places, they were about communities, circulating money, just like uh, Sharon Parr talked about, I think you could get people. But if it's just biodiversity, I would be a little more skeptical. Yeah. Anyone else like to? Yeah, I just, sorry, I, um, I worked for many years on a policy initiative to secure sustainable funding for conservation. And there was a lot of polling done. This was done on the East Coast of the US, but it was a very large polling situation where the support for the public to dedicate tax money to support conservation was across the board high. The highest support was in the urban areas. So for people who didn't have a direct benefit of access to parks, or access to preserved farmlands, or even access to community-supported agriculture, but in the inner city, um, usually minority communities, there was a huge support for seeing their tax money to be dedicated to nature. Now, when that was re, you know, when it was asked why, then the, um, the survey results were basically water health. So they could see it coming back to themselves. They could see that they wanted clean water and investment in nature was going to provide that clean water. So when you asked why, it was very much a self-serving sort of thing. But when you asked would you, it was very much across the board. And it was also both, you know, in the US it's Republican or Democrat. It was also in Republican counties as much as Democrat counties where they were saying, yes, we have support for that. So I think in the right way, and when this it was, it was called a ballot question, so they put this question on the ballot, and every year they put it, the governor would never sign a dedicated funding, so we had to come back every year and ask the governor to put it on, et cetera, et cetera. Every year it actually passed in greater numbers than the gubernatorial election, than any other election. It passed almost 80% across the board. Every year it was put on the ballot, and the last one round they actually got the dedicated funding, and again it was a huge, huge, um, majority for that. Maya? Uh, again, like Patrick, I have a problem with the question. The answer is no. The public's never, public never likes paying tax. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. We don't do earmarked taxes, and I think the problem is probably with the word tax. Mm -hmm. So the public would see the tax going into the exchequer, and I would approach the Department of Finance every October and probably get very little of it back. I think if you, if you put it a very different way and talk about the benefits, and there's a visibility from the point of collection to the point of investment, then you have a very, very different proposition where the public can see where it's going. Um, so, I mean, I'd, I'd certainly love to see it coming. And I, it, while I have the floor, I want to answer the question the gentleman asked at the, at the back. I genuinely think we have our jobs. I think, genuinely think we're at a point of inflection here. I think the motor force over the last couple of days has, 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 has been amazing for us as policymakers. Um, we see the, the quality of expertise out there. It is frustrating that we can't recruit more. We're an organization of in the MPWS of I think about 350 people permanently and another 100 seasonally and everything from a mix of ecologists to technical and professional staff, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and we certainly need to build up our expertise and our staff numbers 
Um, I talked about the priority for me around the, the 440 um, uh, special areas of conservation, etc. Um, but uh, and I hear what you're saying in relation to the to the to, to the stages of project and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we we're in discussions as it happens at the moment with the training agency as well around this particular sphere. But we certainly do need expertise. And when we run, went to the market last year for rangers for 20 positions, we had over a thousand applications, which is fantastic. It was incredible, and a lot of that I have to say is absolutely vocational. People who want to be in this sector, people with a real passion. Uh, for nature. So I'd like to thank all the panellists for your input. It's been um, good to have some debate and thank you the audience for putting all those questions in and uh, answering the polls on Slido. So it's around how do we invest in nature, how should we be spending the money, what are the priorities and I think we've got some way towards it and hopefully we can capture that afterwards as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.